So we are going live in three, two, one. We are live, sir. We can go. Warm welcome to the 46th webinar of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. The theme of the today's topic is the leadership lessons from the legend. And we are really fortunate to have five legends. We have Professor Strut Winstein from Iowa. We have James Wright from Canada, Ontario. We have Scott Cousin again from USA. And two leaders, Benjamin Joseph and Dr. Ashok Jory, they are from India. And I'm sure that we are definitely going to learn a lot from these leaders. Let me give you a brief introduction about our leaders. I'm not going to cover the academic achievement. I'm going to mainly highlight the leadership positions which they had. So Strut Winston is professor of pediatrics and orthopedics at the University of Iowa. He was a past president of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon. American Orthopedic Association, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, and American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. He was a past chairman of Board of Trustees of Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, past chairman of Political Excel Committee of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon, and trustees of Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation. We have another, a very different type of uh, leader James Wright from Ontario. He is at present the Chief of Economics, Policy and Research with Ontario Medical Association. Before that, he was a professor of orthopedic surgery at Oxford. And for many years, he remained as a surgeon-in-chief at SickKid Hospital, where he managed various departments, not only orthopedic, but even other surgical areas also. So he's a very unique uh, faculty that he has experience of both being a clinician and then as an administrator. So we were just talking like he has like he has seated on both sides of the table. So I'm sure that we are definitely going to learn from him. The another leader, very uh, good friend of uh, Posey, the Scott Cosin, who is Chief of Pediatric Orthopedic Surgery at Steiner Hospital for Children, Philadelphia. He was a president of American Society for Surgery of the Hand. And he's a wonderful person and doing a very good social activity. That's a Touching Hand program, which is again a program of American Society of Surgery of the Hand. And he's a team leader of that project. He's very famous for his first case of bilateral hand transplant. I think almost six or seven years have passed of that case. So again, he's going to talk about the team building and how to take care of the team. We have our own Benjamin Joseph, who is a founder member and past president of Pediatric Orthopedic Society. He's head of Pediatric Orthopedic Services at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. For many years, he was editor of Journal of Pediatric Orthopedic American volume. And I would say that in addition to this, he has been played a very important role in mentoring many pediatric orthopedic surgeons, not only in India, but now they have moved to even Canada, to England. So he has been a very instrumental in mentoring these pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Another giant, Dr. Ashok Jory, with Benjamin, he is a co-founder of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, past president of POSI. At present, he is a president of SICOT. In addition, he was a past president of Indian Orthopedic Association, Indian Academy of Cerebral Palsy, Asia Pacific Pediatric Orthopedic Society, Asia Pacific Knee Society, and the World Against Prevention of Infection. He is also editor of Editor-in-Chief of JPOB. Now, to give you a brief background about the format, first we will have a lecture by Stuart Winston, and he's going to share his views about what he has learned 
in last 30, 40 years as a leader. So that is going to be a very important for us to understand from his vast experience. After that, we have another interesting topic, and that's by Jim Wright, and he's going to speak about myths of leadership. A lot of us have a very different ideas about leadership, and I'm sure that Jim Wright, according to his classic way of presenting, is going to burst all the myths about leadership. After that, Scott Cousin is going to speak about how to develop a team and how to run it smoothly. With that, uh, the fourth, uh, we will have a small talk by Benjamin Joseph, and he's going to speak again what he or how he look at leadership and how we can develop that skill. Whatever time we left, we will have an interaction, and again, whatever is not covered in the lectures, that we will try to discuss in the interaction. If you have any question, you can send me the text message or WhatsApp message on the number 97129-25600. I repeat, 97129-25600. If you want, you can take a screenshot of this. Just a brief information about upcoming webinars. On the 26th November, we have a webinar on fibular hemimelia. And I'm sure that, again, that is going to be a very interesting session on this very important complex problem. So with that, I hand over to Professor Stuart Winston. There was a, some miscalculation about the time difference between Iowa and India. And there was one emergency case yesterday night, which he required to operate today at the time of webinar. So he got up very early in the morning, recorded the presentation and sent it to us. So I really appreciate his leadership quality. What is very important is the commitment. And this action of uh, Professor Stuart Winston really showed us uh, or as a classic example of one important quality of leader. So now I request uh, our Ortho TV pioneer, Ashok Shyam to play his recorded video. Thank you. Over to you, Ashok. Yes. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Stu Weinstein at the University of Iowa. I had planned to be with you in person uh, this evening, but I had an emergency. in last night and has to have surgery this morning. So I, I know you're all aware of these similar situations. So I'm really pleased to talk to you about leadership and talk to you about my own personal journey through leadership. I have no industry conflicts uh, whatsoever. So my day job is uh, much like some of yours. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I do mostly spinal deformity in children <clears throat> and hip dysplasia. And I have 37 years of taking level one trauma call and spine call. So I have a life that's very similar to everyone else. But I also have been heavily involved <clears throat> in research and in uh, uh, organizational leadership. And a few years ago, the American Orthopedic Association asked me to put down my thoughts about leadership and what's important and lessons I've learned over a lifetime. So what I'm talking to you about today is, is uh, my perceptions of having spent uh, almost 45 years in types of leadership positions all through orthopedics. I've been privileged to be president of most of the major orthopedic organizations in the United States, uh, starting with POSNA, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, the American Orthopedic Association, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, which is our certification board. I was chair of the JBJS, which ran the JBJS and other organizations which are irrelevant, but that they allowed me to have leadership positions, meeting with the highest levels of even government officials here in the United States. And as you can see from these pictures in my latter years, because of my political activity on healthcare issues, I was able to meet with many of the leaders of, the, of uh, 
our country, uh, in our Congress, your parliament, and including uh, some issues that I had the chance to discuss with the President of the United States. So while I'm talking about high level leadership, I didn't start there. I started the lowest level in my career and I worked uh, on committees. I worked at local, regional, national level. And these are some general principles, which I hope will be a benefit to you, whether you're serving on a committee, but if you do seek to high, seek uh, higher positions, chairing committees, working in your own hospital administration, <clears throat> your academic department, even if you work in your local school board or town council, I'm hopeful that some of these uh, lessons in leadership will be quite helpful. So, you know, you can read a lot of books about leadership. Uh, there are many of them out there. You can take courses, you can get graduate degrees. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I actually have never read any of these and have just learned by uh, doing my whole life. And I don't claim any originality to the thoughts that I'm presenting to you today. And I'm sure that others have articulated them uh, uh, much more uh, succinctly or in, in a better way, but these are just my thoughts. And the first question you always ask are leaders born or are they made? <clears throat> and I think it's a little bit of both. I think uh, in my case, it was always in my DNA starting when I was a small child. I was born just after World War II in Chicago. Neither of my parents were able to uh, finish college because of the war. And I'm what they call in the US a baby boomer. Um, but what I learned in my first few years of life was from my parents because my parents became involved in every activity in my brother, my sister, and my life. They were involved with um, making our schools better. They would be what you call in the modern world community organizers. Uh, they spent time making our neighborhood better. They lobbied the Chicago School Board to get our school districts changed so that my brother and sister and I could go to a better school. Once we got to that better school, they lobbied to make sure that that school got advanced placement college uh, credit classes. And they also helped raise money so that the equipment we used in our sports teams was better than the government issue equipment that we uh, received. And so what I learned early in my life that sitting on the sidelines and hoping or assuming things would get better is really not an option, that you really need to be involved. And I, my experience in the orthopedic world is that many orthopedic surgeons just like to complain about how bad things are, how much the government is intruding in their life, insurance companies, et cetera. And they're just willing to, to roll the dice. They don't really want to be involved. But the first lesson to me of lifelong leadership is that you have to take charge of your own life by being involved. And that's been a fundamental tenet of my life since I was a child. In my early education in elementary school, high school, university, and then in medical school, I took advantage of every single opportunity there was to play a leadership role to make my life and the life of my colleagues better at all levels of my own education. And what I found in these leadership experiences that I had a great deal of personal satisfaction trying to make things better. <clears throat> I learned to deal at a young age, even in high school and university, dealing with adversity, trying to anticipate problems and to address the challenges of being a leader when everyone didn't agree with you and the incentives for everyone was not aligned. In medical school, you wouldn't know any of these people, but these were all leaders that I met in my in medical school training, some orthopedics, some in other specialties. And all of these individuals played national leadership roles. And this was my first exposure to medical leadership. And I realized quite quickly that not every leader is prepared to leave it lead in every single situation. Different leadership situations require different skill sets. And I put Winston Churchill up here because I think if you know a bit about history, Churchill's uh, leadership roles uh, at the turn of the century in World War I were not exactly uh, considered successes, but he was the right man for the right time when Britain entered World War II. But in medical school, what I saw since I was exposed to so many leaders was leadership styles, which I think are not effective at all and didn't stimulate me to, be, to want to be a participant 
with these individuals leading. And these are things I think are very negative when you talk about leadership. And this is leadership by intimidation. You know, you're all knowing, you know everything. It's also leadership imposed by the strength of your all knowing, of the leader's all knowing personality. These folks and this type of leadership style isn't really good for an organization. It's only good for the person who's, uh, who's leading because they're not interested in other opinions. They want to dictate policy. They want to stifle discussion and they avoid the introduction of new ideas or critical thinking. They're all about themselves. And in my experiences on serving on committees or boards with people like this is I didn't really want to be involved. I, I had no interest because they weren't interested in anything but themselves and improving their lot in life. They're only interested in main, maintaining their power or self-aggrandizement, and they're not interested in organizational success whatsoever. One thing I did learn about good leaders is that they're good listeners. And in my opinion, a good leader listens 80% of the time and only speaks 20% of the time. And if you have the opportunity to be a leader of an organization like the Pediatric Society or the National Association, it's really important for you to sit back. And if the meeting is one hour, you know, you should not take any more than 20% of that time in your discussion. The idea is to plan the meeting so that everyone's opinions are heard and you listen to those to incorporate those into achieving an organizational goal. And this leads into another principle, which is good leaders or great leaders are very principled and they're inclusive. Leadership is never about you. If it is, then you shouldn't be a leader and you will never be successful. Leadership in an organization is always about the greater good of the organization. It's about achieving the, the goals of the, of the committee, the group, the task force, um, because those who are in on your team will not devote any time or energy to the task at hand to achieve the mission or the vision of the organization if they perceive this is all about you and not about the greater good. So that's a critical factor if you do take on leadership roles. It's never about you. It's always about leaving that organization, committee, work group, stronger, more focused, better positioned to face future challenges. Leadership is also about responsibility. The organization that elected you or appointed you assumes that you take this role or this opportunity to make that organization, committee, task force, whatever it is, better. They've entrusted with you this responsibility and you cannot violate that trust. This is a responsibility. If you don't wanna take that responsibility, then don't volunteer or don't accept it. And I think that <clears throat> Uh, once again, it comes back to this, uh, not about you. Leaders who view opportunities as self-promotional have a difficult time building teams to achieve the necessary goals to accomplish success. And once trust is lost and the incentives of the leader and the team are not aligned, there's absolutely no possibility for organizational success. Leaderships inspire confidence. They lead by example of their work ethic and passion. I put up here Ernest Shackleton, who many of you know, uh, ship was trapped in the uh, Antarctic and his exceptional leadership sh skills came to the front here to allow his crew to, to, to weather the storm and, and to, to survive. And I think when you're in a position of leadership, you, you inspire confidence by your work ethic. And if your committee, your task force, the people you're <clears throat> leading don't see you putting 100% of your efforts into that role and have that type of work ethic and assume that you expect that from them, I think that jeopardizes success. When you are a leader, you need to be able to articulate a clear vision and communicate that vision to the members of your team. And this requires a lot of advanced preparation, a lot of thinking. And again, in a meeting or a conference, you're, on, you're listening most of the time. And when you are speaking, you need to be crystal clear in articulation of the vision <clears throat> or the mission and the expectations. 
And you also need to be transparent. I think people are quite suspicious of leaders who are not transparent, who they think have a, a, an ulterior motive. So I think it's important to bare your soul, be open about what you're thinking. And you also need to be strategic. You need to anticipate the consequences of action or inaction. You see this play out on national political scales all the time. An intervention is done without thinking about what's the consequence of that intervention. Well, obviously in our organizational work, we're certainly not at that magnitude of country decision-making, but we are making decisions. And I think you need to be looking ahead to see if we choose this pathway, these are the anticipated successes and these are the anticipated consequences of that action. And you need to be able to motivate your team. And, you know, in life, motivation comes from many factors, money, which obviously is not a factor, time, effort, ego, enjoyment, and risk. And I think in organizational work, particularly in, in orthopedics, you're talking about wanting to enjoy it. You're wanting people's uh, effort to be worthwhile. And I think you want them to feel that this is time well spent, not wasted time. As a leader, you need to be very aware of yourself. You need to have uh, to look at yourself with a microscope to know your shortcomings and your strengths. You continually assess these strengths and weaknesses with respect to the job you're doing with the committee of the organization you're lean, leading. And you can make up for weaknesses in one of two ways. You can acquire skills or knowledge, or you can bring people into the fold who have the skills and knowledge, knowledge that you lack or that your team lacks to, to fill these perceived gaps. For me as a leader, I always wanted to be surrounded by the best people. I didn't care if they agreed with me or not. And actually I preferred if they didn't agree with me, because they brought another perspective to the um, uh, to the conversation. This uh, at the bottom there for American history is a book by Doris Kearns Goodwin. This is Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln brought into his inner circle, his cabinet, if you will, the people who ran against him, who were opposed to him, because he wanted to hear other views, views that weren't weren't contrary to his own. And I think if you surround yourself with a leadership team that brings into it a broad base of experiences, knowledge sets and skills, it really helps you as the leader sharpen your focus. It helps you identify weaknesses in your logic or thinking about issues. And it gives you a complete understanding of other points of view, which will be voiced by uh, the group uh, at large. It helps you anticipate problems and un unintended consequences of action. And um, it helps your team members as well. It, it supports their individual needs, their needs to be able to express themselves, to be uh, a part of a valuable working team. And it also allows them to achieve some individual success within the leadership goal. Now in leadership roles, I think it's also important to understand the difference between consensus and compromise. I found myself always preparing for difficult discussions that I knew we would face on whatever board it was by looking at the pros and cons and balancing the arguments that would be offered on one side versus the other, because your goal is, is to achieve a consensus. And I think it's important to understand the difference between <clears throat> consensus and compromise and always try to come to consensus at least in the groups that most of us are in, uh, involved with. We find try to find common ground where we can move forward to help the vision and mission of the organization and to help it to be successful. And if you're always looking to consensus, it, you need to always be adaptable and you need to be flexible. You can't have tunnel vision. It's, it's not my way or the highway. You have to engage the team <clears throat> and look for consensus among the team to move things forward. I think as a leader, you would do a disservice to the organization if you are not totally up to date on in-depth knowledge of every issue. You need to do your homework in advance. While responsibilities should be delegated widely throughout the team, if the leader doesn't have the basic scope of knowledge for all of the issues, it puts the organization at risks 
in my opinion, it, it jeopardizes uh, uh, the, um, the, the mission and it also violates the trust that people who appointed or elected you have placed in you to move the organization forward. Here's Michael Jordan, a famous basketball player, and this is another lesson in leadership. You have to be focused. The team members quickly recognize when you are not totally focused on the task at hand. All of you who are in, leader, in high leadership positions will have lots of things going on at the same time. But I think a successful leader portrays themselves during the meeting is that that is their total focus. Whatever is going on in their personal or professional life is totally put aside and everything is focusing on the business at hand. You have to manage conflicts. If you have if you're a leader of more than one organization, the hat you're wearing at the table uh, when you're in this leadership position is totally the fiduciary hat for this particular organization. If you have conflicts, you have to manage those effectively. Otherwise, if you don't manage your conflicts of interest, then you immediately lose the confidence of your team. Your loyalty or commitment to the organization should never be questioned and you always need to hold yourself accountable. As a leader, you have the opportunity to set the tone of the meeting or the activity that you're doing. You are responsible that all the discussions and the management of the time that's used in doing the activity are managed wisely. And the time isn't monopolized by one particular vocal board member or a colleague. It's important that you set uh, guidelines in which or framework in which the team can operate and that everyone is given an opportunity to use the time. As I mentioned, I think you as a leader are listening most of the time in guiding discussion, but no one on your team will be very happy if you waste the time by lack of preparation, poor time management, or doing non-essential activities during the meeting. I think you, if a meeting is an hour, it's an hour, and you need to plan and execute that meeting in the time frame, orchestrate it, and you need to manage it effectively. Everyone's time is valuable, not just yours. And I think when you're doing an activity in a leadership role, it's not about an activity, it's about accomplishments or achievements. It's not that we met as a board, this is what we achieved. So whatever the organization, whether it's the Pediatric Society or the National Society or your local school board, you have a mission and a vision and you have goals and things you want to achieve. And an achievement is not just having a meeting. It's not an activity. And once again, remember that every single person on your team's time is, about, is valuable. Another thing I learned about leadership over time is it's not about popularity, but it is about civility. A good leader may not necessarily be popular um, because they have to be tough and they have to be organized. They have to set the tone as we talked about. But a, a good leader needs to be civil and respect the opinions of other individuals at the table. And once again, you need to value all opinions and you need to treat all the members of the team with respect. You need to provide them with leadership opportunities within the organizational framework. And you always, as a leader, need to be available to your team to mentor them, to help them achieve the individual responsibilities that you've assigned them or that have been delegated to them. And so that they hopefully can be assuming a greater leadership role in organizations later on. It's not important to be popular, but it is important to be civil. And as a leader, I think one of the greatest satisfactions is watching your team members succeed. And when people do succeed or do a good job, they deserve the accolades. But accolades must be genuine. You never should praise somebody when that praise is not sincere, genuine, or earned. There's nothing worse than you see, I see it all the time. People say, oh, you did a great job, but it wasn't a great job. We didn't achieve the goals. There was nothing accomplished, but people are so worried about being popular or offending anyone that they are reluctant to provide 
critical commentary or, or negative feedback. So in my life, I am always praising my colleagues, but it's always sincere, it's genuine, and it's been earned. And I think if you're a member of a team and not the leader, knowing that the leader appreciates your efforts is often your greatest reward for participation. And I think the other thing I've learned in life is one of the greatest gratif gratifications or um, good feelings about being leadership is when you leave an organization and it's time to depart, that you see that organization more focused better positioned to meet the challenges of the future, and that you've helped educate and train future leaders to assume uh, that role. And another uh, thing that you don't see, or you see a lot of in organizations is leaders hanging on once they finish, they kind of want to keep their finger on the, on the pie or put their uh, uh, opinions forward. I think it's important for leaders to be available for advice if needed, but to leave the organization and move on. And lastly, the greatest reward for leadership really comes in mentoring your team and seeing your mentees succeed in leadership roles of their own. I'd say this is one of the most uh, enjoyable aspects I've had in my whole life, watching people that I've had a chance to mentor or tutor along the leadership uh, um, ladder, move up to positions of leadership and take great satisfaction in, in how they've handled themselves in leadership roles. And the last thing I want to leave you with is this is a turtle on a fence post. And if you see a turtle up there, you know that the turtle didn't get there by himself. Um, I think as a, a leader who is generally uh, sincere, uh, you have to realize you didn't get there by yourself. There are many, many people who helped you along the way. And that's certainly true in my case. I've had many mentors, colleagues, friends, and um, folks who've helped my career along the way. And I never, never, never fail to say thank you to those individuals. I think it's critical that, uh, that uh, folks who did help you know that, that you really appreciate it and that you're grateful. So as someone who's had a chance to lead most of the large American orthopedic uh, organizations, I feel privileged. I've learned a lot over my lifetime. And I hope that, uh, you know, that this has been helpful to you. Once again, I, I do think you really need to keep in contact with the folks who mentored you along the way and never hesitate to thank them about their role in your success. I think they really appreciate it. And certainly as a leader, I felt um, wonderful. I felt really good having a chance to sit down with some of my mentors after I got to leadership roles to say really thank you. You meant a lot to me, you, you helped me and I'm deeply appreciative for what you did for my career. So I hope these uh, lessons in leadership, which are just my personal, uh, um, uh, my personal ruminations about a lifetime of having been able to serve in leadership roles are somewhat of help to you. And I do apologize if I'm not giving this uh, live and this you're watching this by video. I, you know how it is when you, in orthopedics that things don't always happen according to schedules. And this emergency came in last night and I apologize that I have to do it this morning. So I wish you all well. Please, if any of you have any questions, concerns, or want to continue the dialogue, you can reach me at Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T hyphen Weinstein, W-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N at U-I-O-W-A dot E-D-U. I wish you a good meeting and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Stuart. It was a wonderful our leadership tips. I am a great fan of uh, John Maxwell. And like while listening your talk, I realized that almost all the suggestions which John Maxwell uh, give, you have covered in your vast experience. So once again, I'm really thankful to you. And what you mentioned in your lecture, that leadership is not by what you say, but what you do. And your example of coming at last moment or like say early in the morning, recording this video for our viewers and then sharing it with us is really a classic example of your commitment to the uh, webinar. And once again, I thank you on behalf of Posey for 
sharing your, your views with us. So with that, we go to the very next topic, and that is a very unique topic. And I request uh, Jim Wright to speak on the myths about leadership. Over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a uh, honor to be on a podium with uh, leaders from both North America and, and India who I admire so much. Um, Stu Weinstein particularly has been a um, an inspiration to many in pediatric orthopedics and orthopedics. And um, one of the things that he perhaps didn't focus on, which I can certainly attest to, is how genuine a leader he is. Everything he said um, is true to the way uh, that he's interacted with people. And certainly I've learned a lot from uh, watching him. And I am very pleased to be here because I'm hoping to learn some things from some of you all because um, leadership is constantly about uh, learning. And I wanted to talk about five myths, which I think do very much align with what Stu has told us. And my experience has been in multiple situations. Um, obviously as a clinician, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at a hospital involved with the care of my patients. Um, I've also been very involved in national and international movements, particularly around evidence-based medicine. I, I became a part-time administrator at a hospital and now I'm very involved in health policy at a provincial level, Canada's largest province. So I've, I've had the privilege of being in a bunch of different situations, which has given me a perspective um, and this quote, uh, which is almost 150 years old, many of you may know this book, Oscar Wilde, The Picture of Dorian Gray. And at the beginning of the book, he says, experience is merely the name we give to our mistakes. So clearly, uh, I've made some mistakes, and from that I've learned. And then there's a follow-up quote, which I like even more, which is, you must learn from the mistakes of others because you can't possibly live long enough to make them all yourself. And, and I certainly feel like I've made a lot of mistakes, but, um, but I, I look to learn from other people who have some of the same struggles. So we need to start, I think, at the highest level and come up with a definition of leadership. Now, this is not entirely original, obviously, because there are probably hundreds of definitions, but I've taken various elements and I've found this useful and I think about leadership. Leadership is the recognition of. Now, sometimes, as we'll talk about, when you're appointed in a position, you have responsibilities and the need is clearly articulated. But in other cases, and in fact, some of our most inspiring leadership comes from people who recognize the need, which is not necessarily their responsibility. And the second thing, and this is going to be a big part of, of the myths I talk about, is the ability to affect change. Now, I've characterized this as positive change, because clearly through history, there have been some leaders who've been very effective at affecting negative change. But I think we want to affect positive change. So there's two elements to my definition of leadership. One is the recognition of the need for, and then more importantly, is the ability to affect that positive change. So I struggled with reducing it to five myths, but I think these are the most important ones that I've learned. And the first is the myth that leadership is about the position. Many people think they need a title, an appointment, in order to be a leader. But in fact, that is not the case. So all of us on this call, both the audience and the panelists, are leaders. They are leaders in looking after their own patients. And let me say that some people are not interested in moving beyond that. I have immense respect for people who spend their entire lives, professional lives, looking after children, or patients. It may be that you develop 
a, a, a need to affect change at your hospital, in your clinic, in your region, in your national society, or even the world at large, the entire profession of pediatric orthopedics or orthopedics or even more broadly. So leadership is not about the position. And often it means recognizing the need for change without that position. The second myth is leadership comes from authority. Let's just say you have that title and you believe, oh, now finally I'm the head of pediatric orthopedics at my hospital, or I'm the president of the Pediatric Society of India. Well, I think all of us have learned that seldom, in fact, the minority of things we do because we tell people what to do. You have to influence, you have to convince, you have to tell people about the change. You have to convince them that they need to change. You need to give them the knowledge that they need to affect that change. You need to give them ability, sometimes it's skills. And then you have to be relentless at reinforcing that change. Now, once in a while, you do need to tell people what to do, but that is very seldom the case. Even our elected politicians, they need to bring the population along with them or they get voted out of office. So seldom does leadership come from authority. The third myth is that good ideas, and I put in brackets, automatically lead to change. You've probably heard the phrase that in affecting change, 10% is inspiration, 90% is perspiration. If it were only the case that you had this great idea of how you could affect positive change, well, that is just the beginning. There's an enormous amount of work that then goes into actually affecting that change. And that's where as leaders, this requires enormous energy, positivity, and relentless effort. Being a leader is exhausting if you really want to get the bigger the change, the more the effort. So good ideas, I'm afraid, don't automatically lead to change. It's a great start, but then the hard work starts. The fourth myth, and I think Stu described this very accurately, is people believe that change occurs through punishment and money. So when I was a surgeon in chief at our hospital, um, none of our cases started on time. None of them. <laughs> Everyone kind of drifted in and you know was supposed to start at eight. Maybe you were lucky it was 8.15, 8.20, maybe 8.30, sometimes even later than that. So I got a bunch of people together and I said, listen, we collectively, I think it's good for our patients. If a case is meant to start at eight, we should start at eight. So I asked the group, how do you think we should do that? Well, the first thing they said is, well, people who don't show up on time, we need to punish them. And those that do show up on time, we need to pay them more. And I said, well, how about we take a different tact, which is this, let's do this for the right reason, which is better for the care of children. And let's leave aside punishment and money only if we couldn't get. It. And of course, that inspired people, where in fact, often punishment leads to people digging their heels in because they don't like being told what to do. But if you can convince them it's the right thing to improve the care of children and respect their colleagues, then you're much more likely. So change seldom occurs by punishment or paying people more. You need to convince them it's the right thing to do for their patients, their families, and in many cases, your colleagues. And the fifth myth, which I hope is self-evident, which is leadership can't be taught and learned. Now, Stu said there's a bit of both, and I think that's true. I respect people who really don't wanna be in a leadership position. They're very happy being clinicians looking after their patients. There are some people who are more interested in that role, but clearly leadership can be taught and can be learned. And, and part of it is experience and part of it is learning from your mentors. And in some cases it is, despite what Stu said, it is reading books. We learn a lot from books. And so um, I've been very influenced by some books. Um, Drive is a book by Daniel Pink. And oh, by the way, you don't need to, you can take a screenshot, but you don't need to, um, I'll, I'll explain where all these books are referenced. But Daniel Pink talks about what drives people. 
it's uh, purpose and autonomy. Um, uh, these are the things that drive people, not money, not punishment. Crucial Conversation is a book about how do you have those difficult conversations with people? Getting the Yes is a classic book of negotiation. ADCAR is a, um, a, a framework for change management. And it's a, an acronym where the A stands for a prize. You tell people about the change. D is desire. You convince them that they should change. Knowledge, K is knowledge. A is ability and R is the reinforcement. Leadership and Self-Deception is a really interesting book that says as leaders, it's hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And that's a really key step when you're affecting change is to learn the change from someone else's point of view. And then finally, this book, Becoming the Evidence-Based Manager, just like we talk about evidence-based orthopedics, evidence-based pediatric orthopedic surgery, this is a book about how to manage. And there actually is an evidence. Now. When I became a surgeon in chief, I appreciated, I didn't know how to do pretty much anything. And so what I did at the end of my term is I wrote a blog, which I'll see whether it comes up on my screen. And so what I did is I wrote down everything that I thought I knew and I called it practice advice for clinical leaders. And here's uh, the topics, and it's leadership style, developing an agenda for change, how to run a meeting, how to set up teams and task force, change management, how to manage uh, mentorship, retirement. And this is just my idea. So um, for those of you that are looking for what I hope are some, at least one person's practical ideas, how to do all these different things, uh, I think there are 24 different blogs. Um, that I've written over a couple of years. And um, certainly, if it's uh, useful to you, I encourage you to have a look. I have one um, concluding observation. For me, the hardest part of leadership is fighting the dividing line between principle and pragmatism. We all come into these leadership positions with clear direction and principles. But quickly we learn, and um, uh, Stu talked about consensus, developing consensus is the pragmatism. And there's a bit of both. So you want to stick by your principles, but also there's a pragmatism in leaders. Some leaders stick to their principles no matter what. And in some cases, they're not very effective at change. Others compromise too much to achieve pragmatism, in which case they compromise your principles. So for me, this is often the hardest part of leadership and where leadership often goes wrong. So thanks, and I'll stop there, and I'll turn it back to you and stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jim, for an excellent presentation. And it's not only the presentation, but you also gave us a big treasure. Like, we are definitely going to go to the blog and learn a lot of practical wisdom from uh, that blog. So uh, I have a question before we move on to the Scott's lecture. Uh, you mentioned that uh, leaders basically, or like everyone learns from the mistake, their own mistake or someone else's mistake. Can you give us one example, the real life example, where you have really learned from your own mistake? Yeah, so um, what I learned uh, early on from my own mistakes, and that's why mentorship is so important, because that's where you learn from other people. You watch Stu Weinstein. I learned uh, very early on in my leadership was um, the belief that uh, I simply had a good idea and my job was uh, to implement that idea without spending enough time to learn from the people who were affected by that change why they didn't think it was such a good idea. And I just like, oh, you just don't understand. But as time went on, and this is part of the effort of leadership, I spent a lot of time saying, this is what I want to achieve. What do you think? This is how I want to do it. What do you think? And I learned that painfully that uh, without that level of conversation, even if it was a great idea, people dug their heels in. They just said, no, I don't think we're going to do that. So uh, that was something I learned early on. And it's 
for people who are impatient for change, it's hard, but that's where you put the groundwork in. It makes it much more likely you can be successful. Yes, so that's a wonderful uh, like the experience. And I'm sure that the Scott is going to speak on the same because that is very important that if you really want to do something important in life or significant in life, you alone cannot do it. Because I, as an individual, you have a very limited power. But if you really want to achieve something significant, then you need a team. But team is not, not just a the people who have come together. Basically, as a leader, it's very important role to make them realize about the vision you really want to have or the vision you have. And then you need to communicate that vision with your team. And probably that is the most difficult thing for any leader. And we are going to learn that from Scott, how to take your team together so that you can bring a positive change and you can achieve your vision. So with that, Scott, with that background, I'm sure that you are going to also give us some important tips on that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Darren. Thanks for the kind invitation. I'm gonna put my presentation up in a second. Let me just make sure. Do you see my presentation, Darren? Yes. Yes. So my, my slant on leadership is a little bit different than Jim gave and Stuart gave, but I think it's all going to work in combination. And what I thought I would tell you is what impacted me the most in my career with reference to leadership and teamwork. And the title is The Power of Leadership and Teamwork, and it's how we performed the first pediatric can transplantation on uh, Zion Harvey. I'm going to take you through this, and I'd like to start with, this is Zion at age two, when he had lost his hands, he had lost his feet, he had lost his kidney. And this is Zion at age nine after his hand transplantation. So what I'd like to do is tell you a story about how we came from A on the left side of the screen to B on the right side of the screen. But what's even more powerful is how did Zion Harvey go from this, a child who was septic, losing his hands, losing his feet, losing his kidneys, holding on for dear life to this hand transplant at nine years of age. And it's really a remarkable st story. And for me, with reference to teamwork and leadership, nothing has been more impactful. And Zion Harvey to me represents the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes teamwork and leadership. And we applied a lot of the Blue Angels principles for success from the Navy and coaching and leadership philosophies from Coach K, who's actually been one of my mentors at Duke. He's a basketball coach at, at Duke University. And we applied these leadership and teamwork principles to Zion Harvey. So what's Zion Harvey's story? At age two, he became sick and septic like the pictures I showed. He survived being sick and septic, but he lost his hands and his feet. At age four, Patty, who's part of the story, gave Zion her kidney. At age six, Zion Harvey actually walked into Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia looking for prosthetics. He had no idea that he was ever a candidate for a hand transplant. And he came and saw my partner, Dr. Z, and we had been talking about doing free tissue transfers and we were doing free tissue transfers in kids. And Scott Levin was here, who's a dear friend of mine. And we always wondered whether we'd ever have the opportunity to do a hand transplant on a child. But we thought that probably wasn't going to be possible because if you think about it, that child has to be missing their both hands, maybe even, maybe even their feet. And the kid would likely have to have a solid organ transplant like a heart or a kidney because of the immunosuppression. And in comes Zion Harvey, it's, it's such a true story. And lo and behold, that started the whole wheel that led to his hand transplant. So from age six when he came until age eight is when we did the hand transplantation. It took us a couple of years to practice, which I'll show you. And uh, this day, Zion Harvey's now 13 and a, a disgruntled adolescent like most 13 year olds. So what was the team? Well, the team goal was to do the first pediatric hand transplantation. We really felt the pressure of not to fail. 
We felt that if we failed, there may never be another hand transplantation done on a child. And we knew that we had to perform as a team. And that's where teamwork comes in, because that's what separates the winners from the losers. Now, uh, back to what Stuart said and what Jim, Jim said about effective team leaders. Now, we thought a lot about being a team leader and we, a lot about the institution trumps any individual. Uh, this is Scott Levin, who's chairman over at Penn, and this is myself, who I'm chief of staff at Shriners Hospital for Children. And we believe to be a leader, you need to be upfront, you need to lead by positive example, you need to be strong and confident, and you need to walk the talk. Meaning, I firmly believe that surgeons leader, surgeon leaders should be surgeons. And if you decide that you're not going to be a surgeon anymore, then I don't think you should lead surgeons. You may want to lead an entire hospital, but not a surgeon leader. And just like Stuart said, effective leaders, they need to listen. And when people talk, you need to listen completely. And most people never listen. And it's in terms of the lessons that Jim talked about, this is what I've learned, this very particular point. Is if someone needs to talk to me and I'm in the middle of a busy clinic and what they need is my advice, I typically will stop them and meet with them when it's quiet and when it's after and I have ample time to devote my attention to their needs. That's a leader. Trying to answer an important question in the middle of a busy clinic and answering the question incorrectly is a problem that we all run into. Now, team leaders also embrace the power of teamwork, meaning that we need to find out what is the strong suit of each of our members on the team, right? And put them in a spot that they can succeed. If they have a weak point, you don't want to exploit that weak point. You want to get rid of it, or you just don't want to employ that particular person in that particular strategy. And one of the decisions processes that we always make, right? And this is what Stuart was saying, is that the institution trumps any individual. So a lot of times my partners will come to me with a pretty good idea for themselves, but it doesn't align with the institution. And that, that needs to be just said up front and foremost. Now leaders, and if you think this is Coach K, like I said before, one of my mentors, now they have to be adaptable. And nobody's more adaptable than a college coach because every year there's a new set of players, people move on. Every year there's junior players and senior players. And what, what Coach K does, is he has that team develop their own set of rules. So we in our hospital have developed our own set of rules, like when it comes to body language or it comes to listening. And this is just part of the leadership process. Leaders do need to understand feelings and they need to go beyond seeing and hearing. You have to have some inkling when one of your partners is struggling, whether it's physically, or emotionally, you have to have it. <clears throat> the other thing is you have to own it. So one of the Coach K's comments, which I love, is if you make a poor decision retrospectively, still own the decision. You, you made it based upon the information you had. I make it a point in my hospital to know all my employees. We have about 250 employees. I know their name. I try to know something about them. I say hello to them. I, I ask them how their day is going. I think that's super important being a leader. Coach K, who won 800 basketball games, said, I don't look at myself as a basketball coach. I look at myself as a leader who just happens to coach basketball. So let's go back to Zion Harvey. <clears throat> Since there had never been a pediatric hand transplantation performed, and now we had a patient, so Zion was our shared goal. So the team met Zion Harvey and knew what we had to do, because that's the shared goal, because without a shared goal, peak performance is not possible. Now, as we built this team to, to take care of Zion, we realize that members must sacrifice individual gain. And this is exactly what, uh, what Stuart was saying earlier. And each member has a role and you have to commit to a singular goal. So we would practice at night. And if people didn't make the practices, they were off the team. It's very simple. It's hard to have an argument why you're unavailable at eight o'clock at night to go to the cadaver lab to practice for Zion Harvey. In the end, this is what we had. These 50 people operated for 11 hours on Zion Harvey without any payment, without anything other than the care for Zion Harvey. And they were my remarkable teammates and I'm indebted to them forever and forever. Now the team members consisted of 12 surgeons, but we also needed skilled therapists. We used therapists from here, which is Shriners Hospital for Children and where the operation was done, which is Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. But don't forget guys, there's lots of other team members than surgeons. And I firmly believe that surgeons often get too much credit. We need anesthesiologists, we need pharmacists, immunologists, OR nurses, and we also needed the gift of life to be the 
interlude between the, the family that lost a child and us. And, and they, they were invaluable. They came to our practices. They educated us about Gift of Life and they're a wonderful organization. We also need an intensivist, ICU nurses, child life specialists who are just fantastic. And then this is Christy at the bottom. She's the transplant coordinator. We needed help from industry, right? If you think about it, we, we, we needed to have a jig made that we could then replicate and such that when the part came over to Zion's arm, half of it was already cut and half of it was affixed and materialized did all this for free. So they developed the jigs that we used and the plate and screws that we used to match Zion Harvey and to match the donor. We also need to biomedical engineers because we had to make sure that there was an appropriate match for Zion. So we felt Zion is black African-American. We felt we could take plus or minus 20%. So we made these replicas of color. And if they went out to the site to see if the person was a candidate for a transplant, they had to be within 80% and 120% with reference to color and size. And then we had to make sure that Zion's mom, Patty, was okay. This is gonna be a hard operation. She is wonderful. And actually from this whole event, she's now a nurse. And she had to be a proud supporter of Zion. Then we had to prepare. And I love some of these sayings, train the way you fight and fight the way you train and practice accomplishing the task at hand and you have to be committed. So we practiced in the cadaver lab or the soft tissue lab over at Penn. And we practiced on all parts because we weren't sure who was going to be there. So one night I would practice as on the donor, one night as a recipient, one night the left arm, one night the right arm. And we practiced, 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 and we cross-trained. And Bob Acklin always says, preparation is the only shortcut you need. And that's exactly what I say to my junior residents and fellows. As we're getting ready for surgery, preparation is the only shortcut you'll need. And then as we worked together, we came together and that was the beginning. We kept it together and then it was success. And when this process happens and it happens appropriately, then you learn to trust you trust your partners, you trust your other team members, and you just have this 100% confidence in your, in your teammates. And it's a wonderful thing to happen. And then you have to rest, you have to reflect, and you have to recharge. So we often did debriefings after we practice, and we had to figure out what worked in this particular practice session and what did not work in this particular practice session. Because we had to be perfect, we had to confront failures, we had to debrief, and another important leadership principle is when you're having a frank, open discussion, there can be no rank around the table. You can't have bad body language and squelch somebody's conversation. And communication, just in our hospital, occurs in a horizontal fashion and occurs vertically. And we were open and honest with no judgmental smirks on our face or no yawns or anything like that and no condescending nature. And this is hard for junior leaders to understand. If you squelch open conversation, then the people are going to be afraid to speak up and say what's important. If there's conflicts, you need to deal with them openly, honestly, and immediately. You have to have zero tolerance for rumors, gossip, and negative talk because it just disrupts the team. And that's just part of the process. Coach K says everyone's ideas should be heard. It doesn't matter who gets credit. And this is what Stuart said before. As long as you're working toward the same mission and shared, and shared purpose. And you have to capitalize on what, what the best qualities of each individual. And Coach K also says, is two better than one, only if two can act as one. And I love that line. And now we had to clarify the operation, because like I said before, there hadn't been an operation done like this before. And we had to focus on the, on the task at hand. And what we decided to do is develop checklists. So we had a checklist for the procurement, we had a checklist for the donor preparation, a checklist for recipient preparation, meaning design, and then a checklist for a transplant. And what I've learned about this, which is fascinating, take 12 surgeons, put them around the table and develop a checklist. You can't even agree on the incision, right? So you start in the very beginning because we knew we had to make these checklists because there could be no game time changes. This is an example of the checklist just for the transplant. And this was all done well before. So you can see the order from the top to the bottom, and here's the rest of it because there can be no gain time or make shift decisions. And then we had to align the team. Certain people are better at certain things. I do a lot of nerve work, so I'm really good at nerve work. I don't do a lot of vessel work, so I'm not as good at vessel work. So we made this flow sheet where people would come in for what they're good at, because that's what you want to take advantage of, and then they would 
tag team and leave for what they're not so good at. And this is a really important process to go through. And like I said before, this was so interesting to me and still remains the pinnacle of my career. 18 months after Zion walked into Shriners Hospital for Children, uh, we thought we were ready and the gift of life thought we were ready. So we posted Zion. Now that night I'll never forget because the gift of life said, well, we have good news and we have bad news. The good news is we think you're ready. So you, we think we can post for a possible transplant. Uh, the bad news, we looked at our data and we looked at how many kids are in the vicinity that could get to Philadelphia in time with their parts. And we realized it can take up to three years. And then the miracle of Zion Harvey is three months into the three years, we were lucky enough to receive a donor who's, whose family made a very difficult decision. And this is the game on. We had these jigs we had developed also. We had all these labels we had developed. And lo and behold, this is Zion Harvey's transplant. And here it looks right afterwards. This is the night of. The operation took about 11 hours. And this is the hands afterwards. Now, should we celebrate? There's no way. Because high performance teams celebrate their victories, but they stay focused. And we had to keep our head in the game because a lot of bad stuff could happen after this transplant. And we had a backup plan. And sure enough, something really bad happened. Zion's right upper extremity <clears throat> underwent, uh, went down. The artery clotted off. But fortunately, we had prepared for this. So we had retained all the parts that weren't used. So we did an arterial revision using the bone graft, I'm sorry, the uh, vein graft that was banked in the refrigerator. And then we revascularized, and sure enough, here's Zion six weeks later. But it wasn't over. Uh, Zion had hands that looked like they worked, but he wasn't using them. He was depressed. He couldn't go to school. He had no feeling whatsoever. We never anticipated this stumbling block. We were imaging Zion's brain. And after we put the hands on Zion, nothing happened in the brain. We felt there would be an expansion of the homunculus, but absolutely positively nothing. <clears throat> now, we just kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And then what happened is when Zion Harvey had return of sensation. So remember the gift of pain, right? When he had return of sensation, then everything good started to happen. His fingers became useful. He started to incorporate his fingers. Here he is with toothpaste. And ultimately, Zion Harvey has been a success five years later. Here's his hands here. And Zion has now become a spokesperson for the shrine, which I think is just wonderful. And this is Zion just from a few months ago. He has new uh, carbon fiber legs. You can see his hands working nicely and we've become lifelong dear friends. So I think if you look back at Zion Harvey, it's really this statement. People want to be on a team. They wanna be part of something bigger than themselves. They wanna be in a situation where they feel that they are doing something for the greater good. And that's us at Shriners Hospital for Children. And that's the story behind Zion Harvey. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I know that uh, you have to rush to the OR after this, but uh, can you take a couple of questions? For sure. Take your time. Yeah. Uh, the first question is like, uh, this was a success story and every member of the team, they like to be this, uh, like the team member of the success story. But have you failed any time? And like when you fail, what is the team reaction and how the team respond? Uh, everyone fails, Darren. It's a great question. Everybody fails. That's just life, right? And I think what you need to do, especially if you have junior partners, is you need to debrief about your failures just like you debrief about your wins. Uh, we, we just failed uh, not too long ago, Darren. We have a child that we did a contralateral C7 nerve transfer on for brachial plexus injury, and uh, she's on a ventilator with a trach. That's a failure, right? And that's hard, right? And I think when you have something that's hard and complicated, you just, from a physician standpoint, you need to maintain contact with the family. You can't bury your head in the sand and you need to just own it, like I said before, right? So this mom, I'm like, I talk to her every single day. It's been about four weeks now. I talk to her every single day to see what, what we can do for this child. So I think failures occur. Surgery is a humbling experience, as we all know. And they have to, we have to be ready for the humbler but I implore you, do not ignore it. 
you just hit it up front and open and honest with the family. Over to you, um, Professor Benjamin and uh, Ashok for further question. I have a few comments uh, to make. First of all, uh, I congratulate Scott on that remarkable experience. I don't think many of us will ever have an opportunity to do that. But all that I would say to my junior colleagues is just as much as Scott and his team practiced plan, I think it behoves us for whatever surgery we do that we plan. And I think it's a good habit to have a preoperative planning session, which involves the entire team so that they know what is to be done, what is expected of them. So I think though we may not do anything as dramatic and so fabulous as Scott did, I think we can all practice some leadership skills when we are called upon. I have never had the opportunity to study leadership in its true form or had any, any, any formal training in leadership. Uh, as you know, in many parts of India, what happens is that uh, uh, once the, you come of a particular seniority, leadership is thrust on you. And then very often we are totally unprepared to undertake this responsibility. And it was at that point when I was asked to take over the headship of the department that I did some soul searching and asking, what are we supposed to do? And it, it was not easy, but I think uh, I learned a lot in the process. I have just three small comments to make. One is we need to learn to pull together. And here's a picture of dogs pulling a sleigh in snow. And the dog right in front is the lead dog. The leader needs to pull together with all the others. And he needs to convince the others that they can't run in different directions. And that is the role that the leader has to play, that we all as a team pull together. The second comment that I'd like to make, which I think you should remember, is that the, the leadership gives you a certain amount of power, and you need to use it appropriately. And you're all aware of this uh, children's story of Pied Piper of Hamlet. And here the Pied Piper is using his leadership skills to take rats away, which is very laudable. However, the same person can also lead children away and he could have, he was intending to actually drown all the children because the town didn't uh, follow its promises. But it's important to remember that if we lead your team in the wrong direction, you can do immeasurable harm, both to the individual and to society at large. And finally, the thing that I need to say is, we need to lead by example. And I think that's brought out so beautifully by the three speakers. And I would use, with no apologies, a quote from the Bible, which is from Matthew chapter 5, which says, let your light shine. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And I think as a leader, you need to, to, to be a shining example to enable your, your colleagues to follow that light and do something that is meaningful for you, for the rest of the society. Thank you very much. Okay. Could you hear me? Uh, yes. Vera? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, can you take a few questions? Me? Sure. Sure. Not that I have good answers. Yeah. Uh, shall I stop uh, sharing your presentation, sir? Doing that. Yeah, I've stopped. Right. Yeah. So uh, you said that uh, it's better to lead by example. So can you give us one solid example where you have really made your juniors to lead by that example? Not by the talk, but by the example. The first talk that we had, uh, Stu, Stuart uh, mentioned one of the things about, let's take the example of coming on time. Uh, no, it, it wasn't Stuart, it was uh, uh, Jim Wright. Jim Wright talked about coming on time for surgery. 
if Jim didn't come on time, who would? So if Jim wants to make a change, he has to set the example. And so God, regarding punctuality as well, I was a bit of a stickler. And I made it absolutely clear that I would not be late. And so when I was on time, the other said, he'll be there in, in, on time. So we'll, let's be on time. So certainly it, it's worked. Okay. Yes, uh, Ashok, would you like to take a few questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, you want me to ask or you want me to answer them? No, no, no. Ask questions to Jim and Scott. Okay, sure, sure. Sure, why not? Well, um, I must congratulate both uh, the speakers, Jim and Scott, uh, for the really enlightening talk, you know, and deep insights into leadership. Uh, now, I would like to, like to ask Jim, you know, would you say that leadership is a hierarchy or a collaborative effort, Jim? If you say it's a collaborative effort, how is the leader known then? Who's the leader, you know? So you have a team and you have many people and each one thinks of himself as a leader. You know. Okay, they're right in thinking of a leader, but you need a central guy to coordinate everything, you know, and to give directions. So how does that happen you know, when you have a sort of a horizontal structure? Right. So uh, that's a really um, interesting question. And I don't know that there is a simple answer because it is very context specific. Um, Scott, clearly demonstrated this phenomenal clinical accomplishment that came partly, and I'm presuming Scott, because one, he's a world-renowned hand surgeon, but he's also head of the Shriners Hospital. So he has a responsibility. And yet he could have not accepted that role and just said, well, we're not gonna do the first hand transplant in the world. I mean, no one would have ever come to Scott and said, Scott, why didn't you do the first hand transplant? So he recognize the need. But in his case, he was the designated leader. So that helps a little bit. I would say sometimes there's what's called the emergent leader who becomes clear that everyone looks to them for leadership. And sometimes uh, it's a painful conversation about who actually is in charge. Um, it's less of an issue as uh, Scott and Stu and Benjamin have said, if everyone feels like they're heard, everyone's treated with respect, everyone feels they have input into the decision, as long as people feel that it's fair and transparent, who actually is the leader becomes, in my experience, less of an issue. It's when you have someone who's authoritarian, who uh, doesn't listen, then <laughs> you start to see people wanting to uh, mutiny and jostle for leadership. So. Um, I kind of sidestepped your question, but I think it's very context specific. Yeah, I would like Scott's take on this, you know. What do you feel, Scott? Since you led this big team, you know, for the hand transplant. Yeah. I well, mean, I think how did like, you actually go about, you know? Yeah. I mean, the inside story. Yeah, I think, just like Jim said, I think you have to sometimes seek out opportunity and sometimes opportunity seeks out you. And I think in, that, in Zion's case, uh, he sought out us. I don't know why. I don't have any quote from the Bible, but <laughs> I, I don't know why, but he, he did. And we just happened to be in the right place at the right time. But I do think accepting that responsibility to take on any task, whatever it is, you have to accept that responsibility. It's just like when you're operating or taking care of patients. And sometimes that weighs heavy on you as an individual. And that, that's okay, but that's what we do because that's when you're going to step up. And if you look at people like Jim or Stuart, they've stepped up multiple times. But you can't be, you know, I always have this other expression. I'd, I'd rather go down swinging, right? Like it's a baseball analogy, right? I'd rather go down swinging. I, I always say to my partners, we're, if we go down, we're going to go down swinging, but it's not for lack of effort. So we're going to try and make change. We're trying to do a, a BHAG right now. But if we, we fail, we fail. But it's not for lack of effort and lack of commitment. I think that's important. Can I, can I just uh, amplify Scott's um, comment? And I just finished a biography of, of Churchill. It's about the third one I've read. But Churchill said, if I'd never done mistakes, I never would have done anything. And uh, I admire leaders because they take that responsibility and they put themselves at risk. And one of the reasons why I became an orthopedic surgeon is I was comfortable with the accountability. 
I either did a good job or I did a crappy job, but I was willing to accept that. So with the leadership, that means putting yourself out there. Um, and sometimes you're going to make mistakes. And unfortunately, for example, Colin Powell, he made a huge mistake. And it's too bad because he was such a phenomenal leader, but he stepped up, he took the responsibility. And sometimes people make mistakes. But if, if you're not going to accept the responsibility, if you're not going to do stuff, well, easy, you'll never make a mistake. Yeah. Jim, may, so, may I ask yeah. you a question? Jim, you gave the example of, of punctuality, coming into starting the theater on time. You changed the trend, but after you left, did it slide back? So, um, I would say my successor was not quite as determined on punctuality as I was, uh, Benjamin. I think, um, so just so you know, when we started, 10% of our cases started between eight o'clock and 8.05. And by the time I left, it was 80%. Um, and like you said, it was mutual respect. We respected everyone's time, and the patient's time, and the family's time. And that became the rallying cry that if we respected people's times, I would say my successor, not quite so concerned about being on time and perhaps half of the gains were lost, but not completely lost. So a lot of the gains were permanent, not as much as I would have hoped, but you know, perhaps he, it turned out to be he, perhaps he had other things which he accomplished, which I wasn't able to do, goodness knows. Yeah, can I make one, another comment? I think it's important. I think if you're going to lead a, a, an organization, um, you have to be careful about having a what we call a presidential goal, meaning a singular goal that you want to accomplish during your presidency. It's better to have presidential goals, meaning that the entire presidential line or whatever committee agrees on these goals. Now, we, we saw this, I've seen this multiple times. Some guy comes in, he's president of an organization for a year or a year and a half, and he says, we're gonna do this. And like, where did that come from? We never discussed that, right? And then what happens is it's been thrown upon the organization and the resources, they get all consumed, it never works. And then he leaves and, and with him leaves, you know, the, this big hero audacious goal, right? So in, in the hand Society, maybe 20 years ago, we decided that there would be no presidential goal. There would be presidential goals right? Because the presidential line, the life is about a five-year term. And that's a much better way to accomplish the big, hairy, audacious goals. I mean, I think it's really important. And I have, a, I'll make a comment back to what Stuart said also. The other big change that we've done here, and this is also from the Hand Society, is a guy named Mark Anderson, who's very astute about running organizations for the Hand Society. He's taught me tons about it. A consent agenda in a, in a meeting is a really good thing. Right. Meaning you have all this stuff that you have to like approve or read. It just goes on the consent agenda and then you approve the consent agenda. And if somebody wants to pull it off the consent agenda and put it into the name meeting, that's fine. Otherwise, all that bullshit just goes away. And then the time spent is is appropriate time on what's important. Right. And if you get bogged down with ministrivia as a leader, you're done. You are absolutely positively done. But if you spend that valuable time and it's their valuable time, your partner's time is very valuable talking about what is really meaningful, you know, and not how many people slipped and fell. That's what's important. So that's been really helpful. The consent agenda for a lot of stuff we do uh, going into any meeting that's relatively important. So Scott and Jim, would you say leadership training is important for organizations? We don't have anything like a formal leadership training anywhere, you know, in this country. Yeah, I, yeah, I so I, I disagree a little bit with Stuart. I, I mean, he's a leader. He's, whether you're born or made, he's a leader, right? But most of us who lead, it, it's a, it's a, some of it's learned. You know, I think you need to learn. You need to be, you need to take some course. I've taken a bunch of courses. I've watched people lead. I've taken good from some people. I've gotten rid of bad from other people. I ask people how I led. Was I good? Was I bad? What could I do better? I think you need input and I think you do need classwork. I don't think it happens to most of us. Most of us aren't as gifted as Stuart. Yeah, I think Scott's hit upon it bang on. So 70% is experience and learning on the job, but the other 30% is uh, courses, mentors, and books. I mean, leadership is a skill uh, and 
I'm constantly reading JBGS. I'm constantly reading JPO because that's where I learn and I hopefully became a better surgeon through that uh, part. Now, some of it was, you know, the great clinical case that I learned an amazing amount from, but a lot of it was I learned by reading books and, and journal articles. So uh, I think Sc Scott and I are in dangerous territory um, disagreeing with Stu Weinstein, um, but we'll, we'll say that he is such a natural leader. He didn't need it, but for the rest of us lesser mortals, uh, learning was very important. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So Jim, would you say that um, leaders require charisma or can uncharismatic people become leaders? And Oh, absolutely. Um, um, there's been whole books written about the so-called quiet leader, yeah. uh, the introverts, introverts sure. of the world. And interestingly, the literature, the management literature, and this is obviously a gross generalization. In many ways, the introverts have shown more success across the entirety of yeah. you know private sector. They are quiet, they are thoughtful, they listen. Um, now, I have great respect for my extrovert colleagues, but sometimes they take on the stage, they do all the talking. So it's, it's often the quiet leaders who are in the background, like Stu, uh, who spend 80% of his time listening. So um, yeah, there's definitely a role for the quiet leaders. Those introverts of the world, don't be deterred. There's a place for you. Yeah. yeah. I, I firmly second that. I think Jim's right. If you look at, if you read the introvert stuff, a lot of them are better leaders than extroverts. And it's, it's comical to listen to introvert leaders reflect on how they lead. So I, I'm, I'm probably like a tweener. So I actually learn more from an introvert that's talking to me about leading than an extrovert that's talking to me about leading. Mm -hmm. Jim, so you also- Karen, are, are we out of time? Is it's 1257 yeah. in Toronto? Oh, we didn't realize uh, time passed so quickly. No, still yeah. three minutes to go. Three minutes three to minutes. go. Three minutes, okay. Yeah. Squeeze every last thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Jim, you talked about principles versus pragmatism. You know. Now, uh, for a leader, sometimes for a very conscientious leader, it becomes very difficult to debunk principles, you know. So there's always a constant tussle, you know, in the leadership position. Sometimes it's, it's like it appears, uh, let's say, somebody has an intuition, you know, this is a guy who's good, you know. But then you go by the rule. The rule says that you need to have an objective evaluation of a person. And what do you do in such a situation? Oh gosh, I wish I had a um, answer for that. Um, those are the struggles. Um, is creating a uniform way of dealing with everyone, but recognizing that the world isn't uniform. Um, I would tell you when I started at Sick Kids as surgeon in chief, we had three rules. Uh, the first rule is the principle by which we make decisions what's best for children. The second rule is that we're going to achieve that through teamwork and collegiality. And the third rule is, is we're going to do what we say we're going to do. And uh, we all agreed on those three principles and we constantly returned to them, but occasionally you had to compromise. And that's, uh, I wish I had an answer. It's, it's uh, um, that's what I said. That's for me, that was the hardest part of principle. Uh, hardest part of leadership. When do you compromise and when do you say, no, enough's enough. Uh, I'm sticking um, to whatever I believe in. So it, maybe Scott has a better answer. I, I found it really tough. I think Scott has left. Yeah, he we is. Yeah, what he do is you do? There's one minute left. Right, yeah. So um, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that we read a book. But what we learn from the leaders, from their practical experience, is more important than the theory which we read in the book. And this session, the last 90 minutes, was full of practical wisdom. And I like to thank all the three, the Stu Winston. Unfortunately, he cannot come uh, physically, but he took a lot of pain to record his uh, video at last moment. And Jim, with all his practical knowledge, with his humorous example, and Scott, which really showed us what happened on the background uh, before the success. So that really explains that success does not come automatically. We really need to work hard. And that's not only one person, but the whole team of 50, 70 people. When we work together, we actually make it possible. 
or we can bring change. So with that, uh, I, I would like to thank everyone once again and to our audience for joining us. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Nice to see you all.